Hello. Um, my name's uh, Lawrence Davis. I'm the undergraduate chair of architecture here at Syracuse University, uh, and also a resident of Syracuse since 1994. So I have a couple of different hats to wear here. But welcome, welcome. It's great to see this crowd, not just of students, but of people from around the community, I suspect, and maybe even further. I know we have a lot of visitors. This is the admitted student um, season to come and visit the school. So they're visiting the school today as well. And I think they're seeing something, a pretty, pretty interesting thing here uh, that's very lively. Um, the discussion on I-81 in Syracuse is now, I know, at least over a decade old, and there are at least two, maybe three options under discussion. One is to keep a version of the existing elevated viaduct. Two is to replace it with a, an on-grade urban grid. Or three is to keep the grid and build a tunnel under it to keep highway traffic flowing through the city. Um, it's vital to know that uh, this kind of discussion is happening in other cities and suggests that ours here in Syracuse is just a single example of a larger trend. Uh, to that end, and that's the intention of this event today, is, is to bring outside and some inside experts who can paint a larger picture of this kind of urban transformation and use that to inform us in our efforts to develop an intelligent way forward. The use of the plural term infrastructures, you'll notice in the title, is intentional. Not only are we looking at an interstate highway, an automotive transportation infrastructure, but we are also interested in looking at the many other infrastructures that engage highways and each other that are found in a given city. Together, me, they create a metabolism for a city that influences the interaction of numerous economic, social, political, ecologic, material, and spatial systems. Changing one always changes the others. Whether the proposed changes are good or bad, of course, is a subject of debate. But if you look at the history of cities, and in this country that goes back a few hundred years, and in other parts of the world, thousands of years, change is inevitable. Cities never stay the same. With the issue of what to do with, I, with the I-81 viaduct in downtown Syracuse, we are facing the potential effects of such a transformation. The type of change that happens once, let's say, every 50 years, maybe even 100 years. That said, even if we take it down or bury it, the imprint, the trace, the impact of the current elevated highway will not go away. It may linger and may be in ways that we don't expect. Regardless of the approach selected, we need to look at its impact at two scales, locally, of course, within the city, and regionally, which incidentally seems to describe the two principal groups or sides the, the discussion about the highway and what to do with it. So tonight, I'd like to thank the team who, working together, conceived and developed and organized this event, Liz Camel from Architecture, Carol Faulkner from Maxwell, Grant Rear, who you'll meet in a minute, uh, also from Maxwell. It's been an honor, and more importantly, been really interesting to work with them. Uh, their input has been essential on this, now the second interdisciplinary collaborative uh, symposium between the two schools, Maxwell and Architecture. Towards this collaboration, I'd like to thank Jamie Winders, who made the connection between our school and uh, Maxwell possible. I'd also like to thank the deans of each school for their support. And finally, I want to thank our speakers who uh, braved some treacherous weather to get here, They're coming from Washington and Boston. <laughs> um, but, um, but they're also going to, along with uh, Grant Rear, uh, who will introduce them, uh, bring to bear their expertise on this subject. So with that, I'd like to introduce Grant Rear, professor and director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute at the Maxwell School. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, we've got a great panel to discuss the complexities of the I-81 issue and how it factors into the future of the city. It's been called the most important decision for the city in a generation. Um, in the order in which they will speak, we have Alex Krieger, uh, and by the way, they'll come up to the podium, I think, to give their initial remarks, and then, and then we'll sit in the chairs here to have our discussion. But we have Alex Krieger, a professor in practice of urban design at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. 
Uh, he has taken a big picture and, and long view look at cities and at urban design. Joseph Kane, a senior research associate and fellow at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program, and he focuses on the built environment and infrastructure. John L. Robinson, a geography professor here at the Maxwell School, where she serves as the community geographer, and she employs geographic information systems and has worked on projects that are defined by the local community here in Syracuse. And in addition, uh, to those three wise folks, we also have the honorable, uh, not, not to imply that you're not also wise, uh, Ben Walsh is the mayor of Syracuse. He's the first independent mayor in the city's history. Prior to serving as mayor, he was deputy commissioner of the city's Department of Neighborhood and Business Development. And prior to that, he graduated from the Maxwell School's MPA program. That's a fact we're very proud of. So thank you for being with us here, Mayor. Uh, Here's our format. Each of the speakers, as I mentioned before, will come up and they'll offer their initial thoughts and reactions on this topic. And they'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll have a discussion among the panelists. And in that discussion, I might or might not pose a question, depending on what they have to say to each other. And then we'll open it up to a conversation of the whole. And when we do that, I'd like to ask you to um, raise your hand and wait to be recognized and wait for a microphone to be brought to you so that your question or your brief remark can be heard by everyone and also that you are part of the archive um, that we are making from this event. And then after that, that you give the microphone back. <laughs> so having said all that, um, Alex, we'll start with you. And uh, again, thanks to all four of you for making the time to be here. Larry, how does he advance this? Oh. I assume it's a mouse pad. Yes, let me get you set up here. Okay, you are here. I think you're this one, right? Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, I understand you've been at this for a decade. Let me tell you, you've got another decade at least to go. I'm sorry to report, unless you happen to be in China or Asia, as you will see in a second. So obviously I can't, I don't know the, all of the intrigue about uh, the specifics about this, but, but I've spent a fair amount of time in my career burying highways. And so I thought that for inspiration's sake, I would show you a couple of those projects. Uh, two of them uh, with very intimate involvement for many years, the third and uh, Korea uh, really as a kind of a, an advisor only. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that this is an international phenomenon. Uh, you're not alone, and this will accelerate as opposed to diminish in importance, for sure. So let me tell you one amazing immediate effect. So look at this. This is Boston when we had our sort of elevated highway, uh, and you can see it was built, it was cut through the city. These were long uh, warehouse buildings, and they were cut. They were cut. Uh, uh, to allow this thing to come on through. I'm sure that happened here as well, right? Uh, you can see the little, a little, you'll see little triangles up here there, right? Those buildings were cut. Well, guess what? So there it is, right? And how is there? And even before the thing was completed, it was being transformed. So uh, 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 the amazing uh, transformation of the area adjacent to these things uh, is incredible and instant uh, and certainly Pays, whatever, pays off whatever billions of dollars it costs to do this. So just a couple of things. So of course, the big dig is what's called there. Now, uh, two of the projects I'm going to show you involve tunnels, but that's not the point. The point is the gift to the city as a result of what happened. So the big dig, uh, you know, cut through. It was a 50s project. It was actually part of the great interstate highway system that uh, uh, did this throughout the country. Uh, and there was a good reason, in a sense, to do this because cities were thought to be sort of dying creatures as opposed to their suburbs, and this was going to help them. Of course, it, the opposite tended to happen. It accelerated suburbanization, right? Uh, in our case, of course, uh, uh, this was I-90, I the same thing that I took here. Uh, and so without the stop sign, you can get to Seattle from Boston. And that was supposed to be kind of a good thing. And the reason that it was done in Boston, that is the reconstruction, was it was going to get us to Maine as well without a, 
uh, without a uh, uh, stop sign, as opposed to end in, in downtown uh, in this catastrophe. So it was built for about 65,000 vehicles. Uh, it was uh, accommodating almost 200,000 towards the end. So by the way, this was, I'm sorry to report to you, it's been kept a secret, this was a highway widening project, not a highway elimination project, right? But uh, in order to widen an elevated highway, you either had to destroy the other half of the city or you had to bury it. So fortunately, the second solution uh, was ex accepted. And so uh, an amazing act of construction. The reason it took so long and the reason that it cost so much was that you had to build a wider tunnel directly below an existing uh, piece of steel that had to keep, be maintained for 18 years. Uh, a pretty incredible engineering process. And uh, I can sort of regale you with images like this uh, 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 for a long time, but I won't as I go on. So truly, this was all being done while the highway was fully in operation up above, right? Uh, so uh, lots of planning done early on about what should be the result of this on the surface. And there are proposals, uh, actually this was a proposal that we worked on about a series of open spaces and the restoration of the scar uh, that was caused so the pink of the city was gonna go across as well. Ultimately, uh, the decision was made to make it more continuous as a greenway, a green belt, uh, in honor of, uh, once you say it's, it's for Rose Kennedy, the thing was done, uh, <laughs> at, least in, at least in Massachusetts, right? Now, so parts of it look terrific. I actually have become as much of a critic of this, not the, not the burial, but the result, uh, because it, parts of it look fantastic, and in a sense, like uh, sort of intended, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the stuff below has to come out. And when it comes out, it's still very much highway-like. So the notion of a continuous greenway doesn't actually exist at all. Although, and it's a little deceiving, right? Because right, right after this picture gets cut off, you see something like that up above. Now, the other thing that we have to be, you have to be very watchful for, right? These traffic engineers have a way of getting you through the back. We now have, in Boston, twice as many overhead highways as we had before. There, look at that, right? Once the tunnel was in place, and fortunately it was in place uh, where it needed to be in place, where the city was, it had to emerge with the proper, uh, 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 sort of with the proper radii to keep traffic moving and so forth. And some, many of the things that we didn't anticipate was how much overhead highway we wound up with, even as we buried our highway. So beware, <laughs> keep at it. So as a consequence of, of many years of work on the, the so-called Big Thing Boston, we were invited for a competition in Shanghai. They were very impressed uh, with what Boston had done. Uh, in anticipation of their kind of World's Fair, uh, they wanted to kind of turn their attention towards their river and actually towards Emerald City, uh, the future Manhattan across the river, Pudong, uh, where the kind of, you know, world's tallest buildings are being built and so forth. Uh, so this was, a, this was their principal port. Uh, you can see it was always a little bit of a mess, but over time it wound up, instead of these kind of cool horse carts and stuff, it wound up being 12 to 14 lanes of traffic that separated people from uh, uh, the uh, water. You can see a fairly narrow, actually it was a, it was a, a, a levee. Uh, because the river does still kind of a flood a little, a little bit, very narrow. So uh, we were asked to, it was a competition which we fortunately were uh, sort of, we, we prevailed and we were asked to get rid of most of the traffic. And this is what I mean, if you're in China, you can just do that. It's actually very convenient. <laughs> and unfortunately, if you lost a couple of people in the process to construction 24-7, no one minded as much. So what, it, what took 18 years of construction in Boston took two years uh, in Shanghai, and you will see. So uh, this was as much space that was recovered because the 12 to 14 lanes wound up being a proper boulevard, which is what you're trying to achieve, right? And of course, in China, they didn't care that traffic was horrible during the construction, right? Uh, now, there were... There didn't need to be 12 lanes of traffic there. They weren't going to, the, to all those buildings there. Actually, many of them were, were abandoned before this was done. Uh, they were going elsewhere, like on 81, right? Uh, so in fact, only four or five lanes needed to get here. 
which is what happened. Uh, so just a draw, a kind of drawings from the competition, that's, that's uh, not so important. Uh, but you can see below, that was the existing condition at one of its narrower points, uh, 10 lanes, and then various ways to reduce it to four, sometimes six lanes with parking, and then the benefit, of course, was a much wider promenade, right? Uh, so again, drawings from the competition, and one of the amazing things about if the Chinese decide to do it well, they do it well. The trees that were planted were enormous. If you go to Boston, even today, 10 years after, they're little twigs we planted. We ran out of money. We just ran out of damn money, right? Uh, well, in China, they planted pretty sizable trees. Uh, so this just shows kind of uh, during construction, uh, ha all kinds of havoc, um, which we can't accommodate here, <laughs> of course. Uh, but the result has been incredible. On any given day, upwards of, of a, a quarter to a third of a million people walk along this promenade, partially to observe, of course, these old kind of customs houses uh, uh, that were built by the Europeans when this China first opened itself up, uh, but also looking across the river towards Pudong, where, of course, the, man the future 21st century Manhattan takes place. Uh, and it's been an amazing, an amazing transformation. And guess what? No one cares that uh, eight lanes of traffic somehow dissipated itself throughout uh, the rest of the city. That's the thing, you see. You're doing this not for the immediate impact, which may be troublesome for some. You're doing it for the future of your city, decades and maybe even centuries ahead. So, so those are two projects that I, I spent a great deal of time on. The third one is the best. And I thought we'd just kind of play with you to show you. And again, my role on this project was, it was quite minimal as, as, a, as an advisor. Uh, anyway, the kind of last image of the Bund and how, yeah, on a daily basis, I don't know how many of you have visited Shanghai since 2012, but it always looks like that. Whereas before, you could not get there through those 12 lanes of traffic uh, prior. Uh, so this is, the, this is my favorite project. Uh, 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 and, of course, my favorite student, this was, he was a student at the Graduate School of Design and Architecture. He became mayor uh, during this project. He, he, since then, has become president of Korea. Uh, and so this highway, like in Boston, had to be widened. And this, uh, 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 Mr. President Lee said, let's just get rid of it. And, of course, people thought he was just nuts, right? Seoul, by the way, has worse traffic than Syracuse. <laughs> It has worse traffic than Boston or New York. Traffic is horrible. So the idea that you would eliminate this uh, uh, was just, uh, uh, just an impossible thought. And he just said, let's get rid of it. Uh, so there it is. Of course, uh, it, it first you'll see it first filled a kind of creek at the surface. That was enough. So another layer was built on top. Notice, by the way, the scale of the buildings uh, uh, on either side of it, right? Uh, for a moment, right? Okay, so then the renderings appeared, and of course people thought that was just crazy, it'll never happen. It happened, but in a fairly short period of time. That actually is a photograph, right? It's one of the most favorite places now in Seoul, Korea, to walk through. That, of course, was the original creek, which, of course, over time became a, a sewer, obviously, as these things happen. That's why it was covered first, and then it was kind of covered again uh, by several layers of highways. You can see it being re restored. Uh, uh, you can see what it looks like now across seven uh, uh, kilometers. Uh, uh, it's amazing. The air is much cleaner in this area, much cleaner than anywhere else actually in Seoul right now, other than out in the mountains. Uh, you can see the before and the after. Uh, and there, of course, you can see the scale of the buildings there when it was a highway. You can see the scale of it right now. So highways don't bring development. Don't listen to the mall guys, right? Highways don't bring development, actually. Wonderful public spaces bring development. Right? Uh, civic spaces, beautiful spaces, uh, spaces that, are, that you can breathe freely in uh, bring development. Uh, you know what? Traffic in Seoul still sucks. <laughs> but the benefit has been utterly enormous, as it will be for Syracuse, as if you persist. Thank you. I don't have a fancy slideshow, but I'll just start. Uh, so I wanted to thank the university, first of all, for um, giving me the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I'm 
excited to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's actually a bit of a homecoming for me because my uh, both my parents and my grandparents went to the University of uh, Syracuse University. So uh, excited to be here um, and connecting with the with uh, everyone here. Um, so I'm interested in I81. I would say not only as a researcher, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, but through friends and family in the area too, um, which I think is significant when thinking about any infrastructure issue, really. Um, in other words, it's not just about the physical design or engineering uh, specifications behind a given project, uh, but it's crucially about what the infrastructure means as a community asset uh, and the larger built environment surrounding it. Uh, and so in that respect, this conversation, I think, is, is particularly timely and relevant. Uh, and that's where a lot of my work honestly takes me at the Brookings Metro program uh, in DC. Uh, where I primarily focus on the intersection uh, between infrastructure and economic development. Uh, so by background, I'm an economist and a planner. Uh, so I'm a bit of a weird hybrid, uh, where I'm not only focused on pulling together and analyzing granular metrics and data, uh, but I'm also fascinated with squishy planning and policy uh, implications for decades to come. Uh, and so while I'm based in DC, I'm fortunate also that a lot of my work actually takes me far outside the beltway. Uh, which, in my opinion, is where a lot of the innovative infrastructure plans, projects, and leadership has been taking place for some time. And of course, it's also in these different places across the country where a lot of the heavy lifting and hard decisions, financially and otherwise, are taking place too. Uh, the point of, this, of these infrastructure needs surrounding I-81 and Syracuse more generally are not an isolated phenomenon, uh, but they're part of a larger shift we're seeing across the country, where local leaders and other community partners are having to address thorny infrastructure challenges head on, that simply can't wait and need to be addressed now, from devising policies and plans to coming up with the money needed to actually get something done. And if anything, this bottom-up approach is flying in the face of federal inaction and dysfunction on this front. So with that said, I'm going to quickly run through some observations I had on three fronts. Uh, first, the evolving infrastructure concerns as I see them. Uh, second, the looming funding and finance considerations. And then third, the ongoing economic implications. And, and I imagine a lot of these same thoughts will come up among the other panelists and during the discussion. So I hope that this will help set some additional context, if nothing else. So first, when it comes to the infrastructure itself, I think it helps to take a step back and ask not only about the past and present surrounding I-81, but also the vision for its future. To do so, it's not just an abstract planning, design, or engineering exercise, uh, but rather it depends on considering the many types of residents, businesses, and others who use the interstate, including the neighborhoods affected, uh, and more widespread regional concerns at play. When I-81 and the 1.4 mile elevated viaduct were first constructed in the mid 20th century, the primary federal goal for transportation was centered on the interstate highway era, as, as many of us know. Uh, increased suburbanization, fueled by growing auto use, vehicle miles traveled, steered the country's infrastructure outcomes for a half century or more, with the goal for connectivity, speed, and congestion reduction. This translated down to states and localities as well, uh, and still leaves a legacy that we're all living with today. Uh, indeed, we know that the pace and nature of this development has now led us to many environmental and economic costs, and we are now thoroughly in an era of repair and replacement. Uh, this is particularly true given the age and inability of many existing structures to handle increased traffic, including personal vehicles and enormous volumes of freight, as is the case on IE1. Uh, but politically, uh, the desire for new infrastructure and additional capacity, even where it might not be needed, is strong. Uh, nationally, we often lack a clear vision or priority for what infrastructure should mean in the coming decades, as it's often easier to follow past precedent instead. Uh, after all, we don't have ribbon cutting ceremonies when repairing potholes or maintaining existing roads or systems, right? That doesn't mean there aren't some emerging trends happening though. We're at a time when many places and transportation users are shifting their preferences towards transit and a variety of other modes to get around. In this way, it's not just about the need for speed, but about access to economic opportunity. Can people reach jobs easily? Can they get to the doctor? Can they get to school? These and other questions are pressing and may not always be easy to answer given difficulties measuring and acting upon them, especially since they run in such stark contrast to the railing ways in which we design and manage much of our transportation infrastructure. Moreover, the role of technology, including autonomous and connected vehicles and the prospect for other new services over time could radically transform the transportation preferences and needs of communities. It's hard to precisely see how these technologies will emerge and evolve in a changing urban landscape, but we can't simply focus on the shiny object, the technology itself, <coughs> without beginning to conceive what it means for the way we plan our communities and consider the future of place. What will it mean for roadway design, housing, and so on? And of course, issues of governance, federal, state, and local, also remain more relevant and complicated than ever. Although it may be simple enough to think about shifting responsibility to one or two of these actors, increasingly the roles are intermixed, and there are various federal lists 
actions and coordination needed across different projects and across different infra infrastructure assets. Whether we're talking about rights of way, funding streams, or any number of issues, it's not simply going to be the federal government coming up with one silver bullet solution, but it's going to take a combination of roles and responsibilities and a sharing of risks and rewards. And this is true at a regional level too. Multiple municipalities and other groups are often have to be at the table. Seen in this light, the possibilities for IED1 in Syracuse are intertwined with many existing needs and priorities for the physical infrastructure now and are taking place at a time of great shifts in the way we think about transportation regionally and nationally as well. We're seeing this through the years of debate and various options explored for IED1's future and the ripple effects for the city itself and surrounding towns and suburbs, including potential impacts going to adjoining roadways and other neighborhoods. It's not just limited to transportation either, of course, but to future plans and designs for communities, including a movement towards smarter, more sustainable growth, as we're seeing through the rezone Syracuse efforts and other efforts in the city. And of course, I can bring this up in the panel later, but there are other cities, of course, that are thinking about this right now, uh, which I think are particularly pertinent to this conversation. So bottom line, there are a vast assortment of infrastructure issues at play, and perhaps the biggest is money, uh, which I'll briefly cover next. As we all know, since much of our infrastructure, like I-81, is in need of repair or outright replacement, there may be an appetite to get something done now, but the technical and financial feasibility is an ever-present question, and any potential redevelopment and investment does not often come quickly or easily. Once again, Syracuse is not alone in this respect, especially when we think of the larger national conversation continuing to play place on this front. Federally, for example, the need to come up with durable revenue sources to pay for infrastructure improvements is nothing new and remains a vexing and politically toxic conversation where it's often easier to keep kicking the can down the proverbial road. I'm sure we have all heard the backlog of infrastructure repairs and costs across the country. And while leaders in Congress and even the White House debate ways to jumpstart investment, we're still perpetually stuck with funding programs that are inadequate and inefficient. The federal gas tax remains the primary lever to generate revenue for the Highway Trust Fund, which supports many of our surface transportation projects nationally, yet this gas tax supports lower and lower levels of revenue, particularly since it has not been raised since 1993 and was not indexed to inflation at that time. Meanwhile, in addition to this uncertainty surrounding revenues, the ways in which federal agencies like USDOT allocate funding to different states does not always target the places of greatest need or alternative types of infrastructure projects, but instead continues to spread funding very evenly like peanut butter across the country, predominantly focused again on roads and highways. There are some exceptions to this, including, for example, the Tiger Grants program in TIFIA within USDOT, which I know has helped support some, already some projects in Syracuse, but those are certainly more the exception than, than the norm, unfortunately. Uh, current proposals from the Trump administration also remain highly uncertain and lack details to achieve bipartisan support. I won't get into all the uh, dimensions of the administration's plan, but I'll say its emphasis on considering new types of public and private revenue uh, sources remains an area of interest for many policymakers and practitioners uh, in Washington and beyond. Uh, in addition, it's focused on permitting reforms and workforce development in the infrastructure sector represent areas of further consideration and inquiry. However, its overall design, uh, which looks to dangle about $200 billion in federal money to incentivize states and localities to generate up to $1 trillion of investment is, is questionable, to, to say the least. Uh, through an infrastructure incentives program, a transformative projects program, and rural infrastructure program, the administration is looking for states and localities to cobble together more money than ever before, um, supporting up to 80% of project costs in some cases. And states like New York and cities like Syracuse, we know, already have their hands full uh, and simply do not have the endless pool of resources to pay for more infrastructure spending, even if they would like to. And while it's hard to tell where the administration's plan is going and where separate proposals on Capitol Hill are headed, I'll say this, the federal cavalry is likely not coming anytime soon. And if it does, the current plans do not provide the long-term certainty, flexibility, or vision to improve the country's infrastructure for decades and generations to come. This also says nothing of the proposed cuts to existing federal transportation programs envisioned by the administration. I don't think places would complain, obviously, if, if more federal money rained down on them, but Washington by itself is not going to come up with a grand solution to pay for projects like I-81, and state and local leaders are likely to remain firmly in the driver's seat. And this has really been reality for some time. States and localities account for more than 75% of public spending on transportation each year. Uh, they remain best attuned to the detailed and timely planning considerations on the ground. Uh, I'm not a believer in, in what's known as devolution or full devolution of responsibilities to states and localities, but it's going to take a full range of federal, state, and local actors working together to devise new approaches and not being afraid to pilot new projects and designs. 
We're already seeing this in many places across the country who are accelerating the completion of region-wide efforts focused on transit and accessibility, along with other multimodal corridor improvements. The passage of ballot referenda, for example, are putting infrastructure issues in voters' hands, and the uh, majority of these measures are passing, providing millions of dollars for projects in Los Angeles, Seattle, Atlanta, and elsewhere. Above all, I'll say that what's working for these places is an acknowledgement of the pressing fiscal challenges at hand, and that infrastructure re represents a generational investment, where an appetite for shared learning and replication is driving new innovations across different places. And these strategies are fundamentally based on local economic concerns and priorities, which I want to emphasize before passing the baton to the other panelists. In many ways, I should have led with this, but the simple fact is that if federal, state, and local leaders must base these infrastructure decisions, variety when and other projects, it must be in light of a local economic context. We're at a time of tremendous income inequality nationally, and some of the highest rates of concentrated poverty are found right here in Syracuse. From its initial construction, I-81 has left a scarring legacy and impact on many of the most vulnerable communities, and any future efforts must explore ways to promote more inclusive economic development. The development of more livable, connected public spaces would help, as has been envisioned as part of the community grid option, for instance. But any increased property values and land development should also closely connect to the needs of these residents and neighborhoods, including the need for affordable housing. The design, construction, operation, and long-term maintenance of any future improvements to I-81 itself or other adjoining projects represents a huge employment opportunity as well. A lot of my research at Brookings has focused on infrastructure jobs, those short-term and long-term positions related to infrastructure oversight nationally, which represent career pathways with low barriers to entry and more equitable wages overall. Local hiring and training efforts, in my view, should be a focal point of the I-81 conversation and involve collaboration not just among engineering and construction firms, but by the city agencies, workforce development groups, educational institutions, and other community partners. Indeed, beyond the city itself, I-81 should represent not just an economic challenge, but an economic opportunity. Even with all the ongoing vigorous debate, it's compelling all types of residents, businesses, and other groups to collaborate and come to the table with different ideas. These issues do not exist in a vacuum, obviously, but they require input across the entire region, and they probably require more analysis, too. What does it mean for commuters coming from the suburbs? What does it mean for residents who don't even come into the city every day? but experience any spillover effects? What does it mean for shippers, truck drivers, and businesses who depend on 81 as an artery for regional and national commerce? We're at an inflection point where continued planning is needed, but also action is needed too. And ideally that action can help strengthen and expand and ultimately transform Syracuse's economic foundation and make it into a national leader that other cities with similar challenges can follow and look toward as well. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here, and it's really warming to see how many people are interested in this issue on the Syracuse University campus and in our local neighborhoods. Uh, I, I want to start this conversation today by echoing some of the things that we've already heard in the sense that this is indeed uh, a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Syracuse to make a decision about what happens with its interstate infrastructure. And we know that over 50 years ago, Mostly men, white men, sat around a table similar to this at the federal government level and started to make decisions about where the interstate highway would be constructed. And most of those decisions were made in the sense that the highways would go right through the middles of city. And we know that our highways are very good at bringing people to and from cities, but we had to, in this day and age, think about going right directly through cities. And so some of those decisions were made based upon some of the data that were available at that time. And several decades prior, during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, the federal government backed the Homeowners Loan Corporation as an agency to go through city by city to figure out what areas would be um, invested in through home mortgage loans and which areas would not be. And this was not unique uh, to Syracuse, but in Syracuse we had 
uh, federal officials walking our streets and delineating neighborhoods as those neighborhoods that should receive mortgage loans and those were uh, the areas that are in green or blue and areas that should not receive federal loans and those were the areas demarked in red and yellow or an orange color. So those maps from the 30s and the 40s started to uh, set the stage for the urban renewal and highway construction projects that would happen in the next couple decades in Syracuse. And I think this history is really important for us to take into consideration as we move forward and start to think about how we address infrastructure uh, for the future. So the highway was built. In spite of a good deal of local resistance, I have here several quotes from locally elected officials as well as appointed officials who thought that the highway would bring nothing but uh, turmoil to the city. So the highway eventually was constructed where the federal Hulk had denigrated areas as um, unfit for home mortgage loans, those red areas. Uh, that, and those areas primarily were made up of African Americans and Jewish families. After the Great Migration North to escape Jim Crow laws, many of the African Americans who came to Syracuse settled in and around the area of the highway. Today, uh, nearly 75 years later, you can see in this map on the right that we have a majority of our African-American and Latino populations living to the western side of Interstate Highway 81. So when the urban renewal was happening, as well as highway construction, these people were forcibly moved into uh, inferior housing structures that were located to the southwest of our city. And today, as you drive through those neighborhoods, you notice our most heavily concentrated areas of vacancy and abandoned housing. So we've seen some uh, real consequences from the highway that have stemmed into modern times. So it's been, has been uh, compared to Boston when the highway was built, literally uh, a swath of land was cleared. And you can see where the existing city grid was uh, severed in order to create the highway. Just have a few pictures here of Interstate Highway being built around 1967 through the middle of the city, the interchange with 81 and 690. So at that time, several city grid uh, streets were severed in order to create the highway. And when the highway was built, our population was around 250,000. As soon as the highway was built, we saw a massive exodus from the city, primarily to the suburbs. So we saw our population decline almost 100,000 to what it is today, around 145,000 people. So whereas early planners thought that people would use the highway to come to the city and that we would attract people to the city, we may have attracted them on daily trips or in their daily commute from the suburbs, but we saw that in fact the highway being built right through the middle of the city um, made people want to leave the city. In those times, there was little to no public input into the decisions that were happening. Most of those decisions occurred at the federal and state levels with minimal input, not only from our locally elected officials here in Syracuse, but also the people who lived in and around Syracuse. Now that has changed in the last decade or so where we've been discussing what might happen next with Interstate 81. Uh, in 2005, NYSDOT, New York State Department of Transportation, began its planning and invited public input into what would happen with Interstate 81. From there, the Syracuse Metropolitan Transportation Council continued to solicit community input around its I-81 challenge from 2011 to 2013. And similarly, there's been other groups who have made a part of their mission to raise awareness around the various options uh, that exist for our community with Route 81. I'll talk briefly just about a couple of them. Save 81 is the predominant uh, organization or organized group of 
constituents who propose keeping 81 as a viaduct or now as a tunnel option. The rest of the organizations I have uh, mentioned here, Alliance of Communities Transforming Syracuse, the CNY Solidarity Coalition, and Rethink 81 are more leaning toward the community grid model. So I've done a good deal of going through the various um, information that's been made available from these groups, and there's a few things that I've noted in what I've been seeing. Whereas Save 81 has been very good at um, coining really uh, uh, great slogans such as Carmageddon, or that, this, that if we do the community grid, it will cause community gridlock. I haven't seen a lot of data or facts behind some of the really fear-mongering language that's been used to talk about how the community grid will cause economic, um, it will depress economic vitality within the city and it will crush our fragile economy that we've been working so hard to build. Uh, so I can go through some of that more during the question and answer period if people are interested, but Rethink 81, as well as the other coalitions, have done a much better job at using data to support their findings. And I want to bring up an infographic that one group in particular put together. A group of constituents on the north side of Syracuse was interested to take all of the information that was being put out by NISDOT and SMTC and distill it in a way that would be more palatable and easily understood by our local community members. There's been a lot of discussion that um, while community engagement has been much better uh, with this round of discussing what would happen to 81, that the vernacular used and the schematics are still quite difficult to digest by the average Joe. So this schematic was developed using data from New York State Department of Transportation, uh, a white paper that was done by Rethink 81, as well as the newest independent feasibility study that came out to, that evaluates the, the tunnel options. So I just want to walk through this a little bit with you. The viaduct, which is one of the options, would create a highway in its current place that would be 10 feet taller, 20 feet wider. We would still maintain our high-speed highway uh, and the downtown exits would remain largely untouched. That would cost about $1.7 billion, which is equivalent to the New York State total that we have every year to pay for infrastructure projects, transportation infrastructure projects throughout the entire state. The timeline for redoing the Viaduct is about 47 years, and it's estimated that 24 buildings would be demolished. And within those 24 buildings, there's about 683 employees that would be displaced. Estimations suggest that about $8 million in tax revenue would be lost from the demolition of those buildings uh, that are currently on the tax roll. And there would be zero acres returned to our tax rolls. Looking at the commuter times that the NISDOT has published, there's a general sense that commute times would probably increase or decrease about two minutes. And as you've probably all heard, Syracuse has been often referred to as the 20-minute commute city. So by and large, when we're talking about what kinds of commute implications we will have from a community grid, we're only looking at a couple minutes, give or take. And for many of you who probably navigate our city, you know that a lot of the, the highway traffic is folks who live in the city who want to get on 690 or 81 to get to their destination just a little bit faster. But when things like the closure to 690 West on-ramp happens and you have to take local streets anyway, you indeed still can find your destination and you'll get there within about two minutes and if you'd been traveling <laughs> on the highway. I experienced this firsthand the other day when my daughter's school field trip from a city school to the zoo couldn't take 690 West on-ramp and we, by gosh, we traveled through the city <laughs> and we were there in just a few short minutes. The community grid alternative uh, focuses on replacing 1.2 miles of the elevated viaduct through Syracuse. High-speed traffic would be routed around the city, primarily through Almond, Kraus, and Irving Avenues um, for the traffic that's coming into the city from, from the south. It's estimated to cost a little less than the viaduct at about $1.3 billion. The construction time would be about four to seven years. 
And as far as we can tell, there'd be about five buildings demolished, which would displace about 83 employees. It would generate potentially $5 million in tax revenue because of the land that would be freed up around the interstate highway. Think of those dead zones. That's what they're referred to, dead zones. That's their technical term of the areas that exist around the interstate highways that are largely parking lots or uh, just vacant space that is undevelopable because who wants to build their business right next to a highway? They estimate about seven acres would be returned to tax rolls for future development in these areas. And that again, your commute would be changed probably within two minutes uh, either way. Now, the tunnel option long had since been dismissed by NYSDOT as being too expensive and taking too long. But through much political advocacy lately at the regional level, the tunnel option has, begun, has become yet another option that the draft environmental impact statement by NYSDOT will consider. The tunnel is supposed to replace about 1.7 miles of viaduct. Um, through traffic will be maintained but there'll be fewer connectors downtown. And we'll talk about the, the lack of those connectors in a minute. It's estimated to cost $3.6 billion. And as we just heard from our friends at Brookings Institute, where is that money going to come from? It's probably not all gonna come from the federal or the state government, and will probably require some local input as well. And there's estimated to be about 12 buildings demolished. Now, because this study is new and the uh, the new tunnel study didn't get into much other than the engineering aspects of it, it's still difficult to understand what the true property, tax base, and commute implications will be. But I want to look just a little bit more closely at some of the options. With the community grid, um, as I mentioned, traffic in the city would be dispersed throughout many of our local roads. One thing that I am curious about is the impact to our underground utilities on those local roads. Um, I've had the opportunity to study infrastructure with the I-Team, the Innovation Office for the City of Syracuse for a couple of years. And we know that our city water and sewer infrastructure is uh, in distress, particularly in our downtown areas. So what would happen if we did have increased traffic on those roads? That's something that I'm really interested to see moving forward. So the other aspects of the community grid that are important to note are, um, one second, I just need to find my page. That several of the one-way streets that exist around the highway would be converted back to two-way streets, and several of the severed streets that were severed, severed during the completion of the 81 project would be reconnected to establish a community grid that was present when our population was 250,000. Almond Street, which would be the spine of the community grid, would have bicycle and pedestrian enhancements. So this is a, a way to think about transportation infrastructure more broadly conceived than simply replacing our highway with a viaduct. There would be fewer properties demolished, and the land available for redevelopment is pretty significant. I wanna just show a quick comparison here of the 24 plus or minus buildings that would be demolished if we rebuilt the viaduct versus the potential five properties that would be demolished if we, re if we built a community grid. I want to talk a little bit more about the highway tunnel specifically because that has re-emerged as a potential in spite of the fact that NYSDOT had already concluded that it would be expensive to build, that the lengthy construction project would probably reroute most of our traffic through 481 or other uh, rural routes to the east and the west of the city, and it was costly to maintain and operate. Now this had been taken off the table uh, and recently had been pushed back in by, largely by Senator DeFrancisco and other locally elected leaders. And I can understand their feeling that they didn't want upstate New York to be slighted, that they really wanted to see all of the options fully vetted before we came to a conclusion. Because as we've all been saying, this is a once in a generation opportunity. 
So an, an additional $2 million study was um, commissioned and was just released in December 2017 that vetted nine tunnel options, uh, four of which were deemed feasible. The four tunnels that are deemed feasible, called the red, orange, green, and blue tunnels, again, all cost over $3 billion, would take about nine years to complete if they are completed on time. And then they have about a $10 million annual operating fee, and that's to uh, work with the exhaust that needs to be pumped out of the tunnels, for example, and to maintain those tunnels. Now, some of the advocates of the tunnel option have said, well, you know, they just rebuilt Tappan Zee Bridge to the tune of $4 billion. Why wouldn't they rebuild 81 to the tune of $4, million, $4 billion? Well, Tappan Zee Bridge also charges a $5 each way toll. So I'm wondering to the city residents and also our regional residents um, how they feel about the potential of using a fee-based system where they would pay a toll every day to use one of these tunnels. Some of the tunnel options seem to have some environmental justice consequences that we haven't yet had the opportunity to study. And if we are concerned about uh, undoing or rectifying past environmental injustices, these are things that I think really need to take into consideration. First, there would be a jet fan system that removes exhaust from the tunnel. And those exhaust tunnel, those exhaust fans would probably uh, put out their exhaust in oops, some of the neighborhoods that are already affected here. Now, another interesting thing to note about the tunnel is that if you're planning to go downtown to our educational facilities, SU and ESF, for example, or our hospitals, you wouldn't use the tunnel. You'd get off before you got onto the tunnel. So if a good deal of our traffic is coming into the city to get to our eds and meds and our downtown area, the tunnel just doesn't seem to make that much sense. It's been projected that about 2,000 cars during the daily morning commute and afternoon commute would use the tunnel. So it seems like quite a large expense to go through for such small volume of traffic that's continuing to travel all the way through the city. So this tunnel option, even though it had been dismissed, is now back on the table and will be included in the draft environmental impact statement, which will measure the social, economic, environmental impacts of the three options now, the viaduct, the community grid, uh, as well as one of the tunnels. It's presumed that they'll study the orange option, which was the preferred tunnel that was in the in that was in that, um, that study, but it's unsure which tunnel would actually be used. What are the other things I want to note about the tunnel in terms of its environmental justice impacts is that the staging area for entering the tunnel would be located about a block away from Dr. King Elementary School. And the environmental and social justice impacts of what that staging area would look like is relatively unknown at this point. But again, if we're concerned about doing right by these neighborhoods in particular, we'd want to pay particular attention to that. In the community grid alternative, much of the severed streets that connect our west and southwest neighborhoods to where we see most of our employment opportunities at our hospitals and our educational facilities would be much easier to access. We know historically that we've had a tremendous amount of job growth around Syracuse in our suburban fringe area, and that those areas are very difficult for low-income neighborhood residents to get to. Our public transportation is lacking, and if you don't own a car, it's very difficult to get to jobs in the suburban fringe. The community grid opens those travelways and pathways back up between the east and west of the city so that commuting between our more low-income neighborhoods um, to our areas of employment around our education and medical facilities is enhanced. So I just want to conclude by say, suggesting that there has been a good deal more of public input than historically when we built the highway the first time around. 
but what often is seen is that that input is still largely skewed. There are not many African American or Latino voices that are being heard through this discussion. When I go through Syracuse.com and I read all of the letters to the editor and the comments that have been submitted over the last 10 to 10 years, uh, I see mostly uh, politically elected officials who've commented from the region. When I visit 81, uh, Save81's website and I click on all the various statements that have been put out by our surrounding town supervisors and transportation authorities, I'm not seeing any very clear evidence of what they find to be the negative impacts to the city and the region by rerouting traffic. It seems more of a NIMBY, not in my backyard type of argument than it does have any real consequence for regional economic development or city economic development. And as we know, strong cities make strong regions. And if we have an opportunity to do something with 81 that will bring about economic opportunity and economic revitalization to the city, I think we'll see those ramifications throughout the region, which will be good for everyone. There was a sense that if we rerouted traffic to, around the city to 481, that we would have economic development opportunity in other areas and not in the city itself. But as you know, if you travel the highway or through the community grid system, there's not that much traffic that goes through, tra through Syracuse right now. Increased traffic over our community grid system might improve economic um, vitality of our downtown stores and businesses and restaurants by having even more opportunity to serve regional customers. So I'll leave my, my comments there until we bring it back together for our combined conversation. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ben Walsh, and the relatively new mayor of the city of Syracuse here. And boy, if I wasn't convinced that the community grid option was the right option before this this panel, uh, uh, I certainly am now. So uh, nice job. Going last is a, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, Janelle uh, pretty much took every point that I wanted to make uh, on uh, on why I support the community grid. But I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to reiterate them because one thing that I've learned over the past decade is that as much as we continue to reiterate uh, the, the the case and and try to inform the the conversation with data, uh, there's still a lot of people that uh, it hasn't that it hasn't gotten to. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to reiterate some of those points. Um, right now. So people often ask, why, why am I such a passionate advocate for the community grid? So I, I try to take them through each one of the alternatives and give them uh, just some highlights uh, that, that Janelle covered in great detail. So let's look at the viaduct. The comment that I hear more than any other, whether I'm talking to um, city stakeholders or suburban stakeholders, is why are we even talking about this? Just leave it the way it is. It's fine the way it is. People don't understand that the status quo is not an option. Uh, the New York State DOT has said that the elevated viaduct has reached the end of its useful life. And so if, if people want to see a viaduct continue through the city, as Janelle pointed out, it has to be higher and more importantly, wider. And what that means is more property demolitions at a time when you look at what's driving investment in our city, much of it is the adaptive reuse of, of his, our historic building stock. And we're at, at, and at that time, we're talking about uh, demolishing more properties when our city has seen more than its fair share of demolitions. We're talking about displacement of residents. So it's so important to have that historical context that we just had to understand the wrong that was, that was done to the city of Syracuse when, when 81 came, came through uh, uh, against the objections of, of all of the city officials. So this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to right a past wrong and, uh, and again, with a, with a viaduct option, we're talking about displacing more residents and businesses. And selfishly, as, a, as the mayor of a city that is facing a substantial uh, operating deficit going into my first budget, 
uh, the, the viaduct takes more properties off of the tax rolls when tax exempt properties is our uh, is a, that issue is probably our most uh, our, our most significant challenge. Uh, so for me, the, the viaduct isn't isn't even on the table. So then we look at the tunnel. I am always I always gravitate towards compromise, and I love the idea of uh, of us finding a compromise, a, a, a win win here uh, in this debate. But the tunnel is not that, again, for many reasons you've already heard. Um, Alex, I'm going to steal your line. Uh, uh, you, as you appropriately said, the stuff below has to come out. And, and people, I don't think, understand that. That means cars. And you talked about that, the ingress and egress out of the tunnel, the disruption that that has on the existing street grid is significant and, and can't be uh, underestimated. And as Janelle pointed out, uh, the air. Um, it, environmental justice is such an, a critical component of this, um, and, and the tunnel has to be ventilated. And in many cases, we're looking at ventilation towers uh, that are going to disrupt uh, the, the streetscape uh, that is allegedly going to be preserved if a tunnel comes through. And when I had the chance to sit in a briefing by the, by the, uh, by the consultant that had been hired uh, by the state to do the most recent tunnel study, they said, well, we don't have to use venting towers. We can vent it on each end of the tunnel. And, as, and, and it, if that's even possible, as Janelle pointed out, what's at, the, what's at the southern end of the tunnel? An elementary school. So that's where we're going to ventilate. Um, it, it makes no sense to me. Uh, this, uh, this idea of Carmageddon, uh, you know, the, the numbers move around a little bit. But we are already funneling the vast majority of traffic that comes along 81 uh, through the city into the city. Uh, up, upwards of 80% of the traffic that comes uh, through the city goes down in, and right now uh, comes into the city through existing bottlenecks, uh, those being the, the Harrison and Adams on ramp. So this idea that we're dumping all of this traffic into the, uh, into the community grid, we already are, uh, and we have an opportunity to make a, a more efficient grid. So that leaves us with the community grid option. Um, I mentioned that the opportunity to write a past wrong. I mentioned the opportunity to put more properties on the tax rolls. Uh, and as I think, uh, Joe, you, you correctly pointed out, it's an opportunity not just to see development, economic, uh, any kind of economic development uh, uh, in this community, which for a long time I think has been the, uh, has been the approach. Uh, any development is good development. We know that's not the case. It, it gives us an opportunity to be intentional and inclusive in the development. And I often point out that what's separating the elevated viaduct are, are two of our most prosperous, growing uh, areas in not just the city, but in the region, in downtown and University Hill. But we can't underestimate the impact that it can have on the southern and northern end of this, uh, uh, of this project area, namely uh, on the south side and in, in, uh, um, looking specifically at Pioneer Homes, Central Village, the Syracuse Housing Authority properties, uh, and to the north, uh, around the near north side. Uh, we have an amazing opportunity to uh, to re knit the fabric of the city and to, to do it in a way that that emphasizes mixed income uh, and mixed use development. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a great opportunity, not just economic development, workforce development. And again, that was brought up. Um, you know, I've been as many of us have been frustrated by the delay uh, of of the state decision making process. But what it, when I start to find myself getting really upset about it, I remember. I, I remind myself that if, this, if the decision was made tomorrow, we as a community would not be ready to take full advantage of the economic opportunity that, that we're going to be presented with. Uh, we don't have the workforce right now. We don't have, our, our contractors don't have the capacity. And so what I've, uh, I've tried to funnel my frustration into uh, identifying opportunities to build that capacity uh, over the next year as the final decision is being made. I, uh, we looked around at models. We found a, a, we, what we think is a great model in San Francisco and their city build initiative and if, uh, are adapting it to, to what we're calling um, Syracuse build. And we're working with the folks in San Francisco uh, to bring all of the right partners, the workforce development partners, to the table to make sure that we are building our capacity to make sure that we, we are building a, a, a workforce, uh, especially in our most marginalized uh, neighborhoods, that isn't just prepared to take advantage of the short-term construction opportunity, but the longer-term economic opportunities that are going to come from the right type of development. Uh, on a lighter note, um, I, you know, I, I've said uh, throughout this debate that, it, that there's something that just really bothers me about the fact that 
as we look at, out at other communities and what they're doing. Um, you look at, uh, you know, I often point to, uh, to Dallas and Dubai that are, uh, that are gonna be piloting driverless flying vehicles. Forget about driverless you know, driving vehicles. We're talking about driverless flying vehicles. And here we are debating whether or not we wanna double down on 20th century infrastructure as we're trying to prepare for a 21st century economy. It's crazy, uh, but here we are. Um, that being said, as, as much as I, uh, I'm reflecting on the tone that I just took there, um, <laughs> I, I have tried not to take that tone uh, uh, during the first few months of my administration because the, the, re the reality is um, it is not productive to be dismissive of those uh, that, that disagree with us. And so I really have sincerely tried to engage uh, with those that don't share uh, my opinion. Uh, prim namely our, my suburban counterparts, to better understand what their concerns are and to try to identify opportunities where I, as the mayor of the city, uh, and we uh, 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 as a community can help address some of these issues. Because if you begin to dig down on them, mo the common uh, factor is that most of the issues that people are concerned about are issues that exist today. And unless anything's done about it, will be issues that exist uh, after this project is done, whatever we do. So let's just take a couple examples. So uh, our neighbors in DeWitt, where uh, we're talking about rerouting the through traffic around 481. Um, they have uh, concerns about what that, uh, what that traffic uh, will do, uh, how that will imp impact their neighborhoods. But if you, if you start to talk to them about 481, you'll find that um, uh, certain things that weren't done when 481 was constructed to begin with, namely sound attenuation uh, and also uh, um, um, the, the way in which uh, that the current uh, on-ramps and off-ramps are configured has been a, has caused uh, issues uh, for quality of life issues for uh, for DeWitt that exist today. Their concern, of course, is that if 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 we go uh, if if we make the wrong decision from their perspective that uh, that those issues could be exacerbated. My position is let let's not wait. Let's let's uh, separate these issues and try to work with the state. Uh, and take advantage of this opportunity that we have to, to fix the problems that weren't addressed initially. I think we have an opportunity to do that. I sat with uh, a, a Town of DeWitt Supervisor, at, Supervisor Ed Michaelenko the other day and I, and I told him that and offered to, to help. I'm happy to use some of my political capital to, to help solve these problems. Similarly, in the Finger Lakes, you talk to the folks in Skinny Atlas in Auburn. They have a problem with trucks uh, that are driving uh, from the south up 81 instead of going all the way up to the, the thruway and going over, these are trucks that their final destination is Seneca Meadows uh, landfill uh, in Seneca Falls. They are cutting through the, the towns and villages uh, right now. The concern is that if we, if we, uh, if we add an additional uh, uh, rerouting around 481 that that will exacerbate that problem. It may, it may not, but the fact is it's a problem today. And I'm convinced with the right people at the table, uh, there are solutions to that problem today. And so I've encouraged our counterparts and my counterparts to focus on what those potential solutions are. And again, I will march arm in arm with them to Albany and try to fix those solutions. Um, they're uh, clo a little closer to home, Salina, the town of Salina, you know, they, they've, uh, in many ways, their, their economy is built around the current configuration of 81 and the thruway, and um, that's the reality of it. Uh, but that's looking very myopically at the, at the relatively small economy in that town. And I think if you look at it at, at, at a regional level, there's an opportunity. Uh, there will be some short-term pain for sure on some of those businesses, especially the hospitality businesses, hotels and motels that are built around that interchange. But I think if we take a more regional approach to economic development, we can help uh, them to, to benefit in the longer term. The mall, uh, I think, uh, Alex, you mentioned that. Listen, I, you must be... You must be aware that we have a mall here, and uh, and uh, and they have not been shy in sharing their uh, their opinions um, uh, about uh, you know a, a essentially any any scenario that does uh, does not have 81 going right across their front door is a problem for them. Again, thinking myopically in short term, uh, I understand their concern, but it's it's they are what they're thinking about our economic conditions today as opposed to the much larger, broader economic implications uh, uh, that could. Uh, that you have to take into consideration when you look at what we could become and what we could develop. Um, we're looking at the size of the existing pie as opposed to actually increasing the size, the size of the pie and, and how, we might, how everyone might be able to benefit from it. So um, it's important that we aren't dismissive of those concerns, uh, but my focus is trying to help 
uh, our partners to, to uh, address those issues uh, and also help them to understand why just as uh, they don't want uh, traffic driving down their main street and, uh, and, and right in front of their front door, I, th I think it's okay to say that we in the city of Syracuse don't want it either. And we've had to live with the impact of having that be the case for 50 years. And again, we have a chance to, to right a, a significant past wrong. So uh, with that, I look forward to continuing the conversation with the panel. Thanks to all four of you. I have one specific question of my own that is a concern that, that none of you really talked about. Alex hinted at it briefly once. If we have time, I'll work that in. That's kind of my pet question, so I don't want to. But, I, but let me start with two other things first. Uh, a general question for the group, but before that, a specific question for the mayor. And I want to. Uh, jump off of the, the, the subtitle of the panel here, the over and under of I-81, and just ask you, given where things are right now, what is your read of the likely outcome? What, what, if you could put probabilities on it even, what do you think is the decision that is going to be made? Grant, the, the, the campaign's over. I thought we were done with the, the hard-hitting questions. Uh, it, 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 it's a good question, and you know, I'm not going to take a shot at a specific probability, but, but I, I think one of the things that strikes me in this debate is that um, what I've heard from a lot of uh, the tunnel proponents, um, namely elected officials, is when we have this, the, the conversation, the debate, they say, well, take, let's take money off the table for a minute. Take money off the table. If, that, if money's not an, op not an issue, What's wrong with the tunnel? And I proceed to explain to them what's wrong with the tunnel. But when has money not been a consideration, especially these days? And, it, and I, I would like to think that as, uh, as the federal debate on infrastructure has moved forward, and uh, while still uh, not clear, the, the current administration's, uh, 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 at least initial pr proposals, have made it clearer. Uh, that there is not going to be um, uh, this hu huge pot of money that we're going to be able to tap into and do whatever we want with. So I, I think between as, as easy as it is to use fear and misinformation to, uh, to influence the, the debate, I think uh, I have hope that uh, we, have the, we have the facts and the data on our side and combined with the fiscal realities that we're all facing that ultimately we do come to the community grant us the right option. So let me put this uh, general question to the group. As the mayor pointed out in his remarks, um, you seem to be in heated agreement on this, the four of you, or at least I could not detect, and as a political scientist, this is my habit to always listen for the conflict. I didn't really hear any uh, among the four of you. So just general question for the group. I don't know who wants to jump in, but did any of you hear anything from your colleagues that you would either want to comment on, probe a little bit, um, investigate a bit further uh, among the group here. I'm always happy to say something. I'm not sure if I can answer your question there. I, well, most of the assumptions about cost, forget about it. <laughs> right. That should not be the decision. It should not be a decision about cost. By the way, the Boston project was estimated to cost $2.8 billion. It wound up costing $16 billion. Now, there, there's actually a, a secret there, which is we got 300 acres of parks out of it, among other things. We got all kinds of uh, improvements to traffic elsewhere in the city as well, because for a while, while the spigot was going, uh, our leaders uh, added signs saying, thanks to the Big Dig project, and so the scope expanded dramatically. By the way, that was another benefit, actually. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting you're gonna spend $16 million, but, but the point is, these large-scale endeavors have other potential benefits as they get going. Uh, and uh, uh, that should be thought about as well. 
Uh, I don't know enough about uh, Syracuse to know whether a tunnel is a terrible idea. The only reason that a tunnel would be a, a, a good idea is if through tra regional through traffic was a major issue. That was the case in Boston, right? If it's not, the tunnel is just as bad as a viaduct. It's just less visible, except when it appears, right? The tunnel is a little bit like also another bypass. You know, another way in which uh, American sort of urbanism went awry is all those bypasses around cities were built as well. Not every highway is built through a city. A lot of them were built around the city, and that's where all the suburban development took place as well. So the tunnel wouldn't be very helping very much. It's just a fear of traffic which we should get over. Uh, and so I think the tunnel can be as disruptive as the viaduct. Uh, the benefit that you all have, and it's true in other parts of the country right now, is that you have to do something. You have to do something, and that's the important thing, so keep pressing upon that. Uh, I'll just add, you know, I don't have a definitive stance one way or the other, right, of, of yes, let's definitely do this, let's definitely do that. I'm always more, it depends. <laughs> let's see more data, uh, and it was helpful, right, to, to see some of those metrics that were calculated, and even if one option is selected over another, it's not as if mission is accomplished once that's been selected or preferred. There are still significant questions and next steps in terms of the execution of the construction, the design, the maintenance, and particularly what the benefits will mean at, at a community level. And, and so, I mean, I'm looking at this in many different places across the country. I mean, New Haven actually is dealing with a very similar issue at the moment with uh, Route 34, I believe, and they're doing a downtown crossing project and they've received actually federal support uh, through Tiger Grants, uh, and they are dealing with very similar issues. They've got Yale University right there, <laughs> but they have tremendous levels of poverty uh, in the neighborhood, uh, and so there's this opportunity, right, where there's a road that just, you know, is reaching the end of its useful life, as the engineers like to put it, and they're doing something about it. They're experimenting with it, but they're going in different phases. They have a phase one, a phase two, a phase three, uh, and it's requiring a lot of collaboration uh, not only with the city leadership, but with a lot of uh, groups and community organizations to make sure that those benefits actually translate to some of the most vulnerable members of the community in terms of housing. So that there isn't just an influx, right, of gentrification, right? Because with increased property values, you know, that isn't just, you know, <laughs> mission accomplished, right? I mean, that, that, that needs to translate into actual opportunity for everyone. And so I would just urge everyone as we're, as we're thinking of the actual design and the execution and what's chosen and chose the option, that's, that doesn't, that's not where it ends. In many ways, that's where it starts right. and, and that's where, really, where the conversation has to keep going. We're involved in that project and I know it very well. So it's true, it begins as a kind of a social justice question because there it's Yale or it's African American, very mi minority uh, income areas. One of the reasons why it's going slowly is actually to try to mitigate the negative effects of gentrification as well. But uh, in that case, a surface boulevard is ultimately gonna happen as opposed to a rebuilding of a tunnel, uh, of, a, of a viaduct or a tunnel. So it, most of the times that would be the better solution unless there's some kind of imperative to get lots of cars through Syracuse as opposed to engage in Syracuse. So, okay, I am, I am gonna ask my pet question then. Uh, and Joe, you just alluded to it when you said, you know, this isn't, this isn't the end, it's the beginning of a process. And you mentioned the construction itself. So, one of the things that I worry about most in thinking of this is something that is, is, is there regardless of the option that gets chosen. And Alex, I'll go back to your first presentation on this because you alluded to this briefly. Well, there will be disruptions. There will be problems in this, and some people are gonna not enjoy the process. But the three cities that you put forward as juxtapositions to ours, I'm not saying you intend it that way, but nonetheless, are large cities with very solid bases. I mean, those cities aren't going anywhere and they're vibrant. And I don't think that can necessarily be said about Syracuse. And so what, that, what I worry about is the construction process itself. So Janelle, you said four to seven years or nine. Okay, I'm gonna be optimistic and say seven, all right? Let's say it's the community grid, seven. 
what happens during that time period and how does it affect the city and how does it affect people's impressions of the city and in particular what I worry about is and 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 mayor you know this very well you know the 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 sales job that has to be done and the, and, the, and the management of the relation between the city and the suburbs. And so what happens to those folks outside if, as we're experiencing this construction project? I don't know if any of the four of you have best practices or warnings or, or any other things that we should be thinking about as we think about how does this actually get done? That's what worries me. Well, I'll start by saying that there are many negative perceptions that keep uh, our regional occupants out of the city as it stands now. And so I can imagine that the thought of being caught in construction traffic would also be a deterrent to come into the city. So for whatever option does end up making its way through, I think we do have to do a really good job of helping people navigate while that construction is happening. When I look at the various alternatives and I look at the existing street network of Syracuse, I can only imagine that by virtue of trying to avoid construction that we will have a bit of a community grid temporary system on our hands and that, <coughs> that traffic that is trying to uh, just go from north to south or south to north directly through the city would still use 481 as an alternate route or some of our um, our rural routes through our eastern suburbs. So there's going to be impact regardless. And I think Mayor Welsh made a really good point that if we can start to think proactively about what some of those trade-offs might be with our suburban counterparts earlier rather than later, some of their concerns might be alleviated regardless of what option happens. Um, I've long heard that, this, that Skinny Atlas and other villages are uh, concerned about the truck traffic going to the waste facility. And I can't imagine that there's not a solution that doesn't look at either relocating the waste facility or figuring out other ways for us to move our waste into those waste facilities is one example. Uh, but I think that we have to do a tremendous job of, of making people aware of, of the construction impacts and helping them navigate our city both in the short term while we're undergoing construction as well as the long term. So again, I think that uh, the tunnel would be the worst, <coughs> absolutely the worst. There's no question in my mind. Uh, the viaduct would be pretty bad too. The advantage of the grid would be that you might start actually by improving the surface streets right. and letting that, all that, that stuff, the thing's not gonna fall down tomorrow. You don't have to start by demolishing 81. You can start actually by finding ways of improving the streetscape. Uh, so that's really a benefit. Uh, uh, so again, I think the grid, the, the community grid, that, that alternative I think might be least disruptive. Uh, secondly, there are other benefits. In Boston, there was 18 years of 100% construction employment, not to mention for planners, designers, and community activists. <laughs> uh, and actually, one of the major, one, a th almost a third of the cost of, uh, of the cost attributed to the big dig was actually investment in uh, uh, sort of mitigation costs, right? That were dealt with in a fairly serious way to properties that were being kind of most affected. So it's not all downside. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to create a panacea. There are disruptions, but there are also upsides of undertaking a major multi-year construction effort and uh, 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 looking ahead to the benefits that will result as well and the uh, employment possibilities uh, in the interim. Uh, I would just add, you know, when it comes to a lot of these bigger infrastructure projects, the devil's in the details. <laughs> of course, and so, yeah. you know, tossing around anecdotes and saying there will be something like this or we think there will be impacts here, you know, that's probably not going to fly, not only politically, but, but in terms of the economics, right, of, of the project, not only in terms of the cost, but in the benefits and, and what those benefits may actually translate to be, right, across the whole region, not just the city, but, but the suburbs and other, um, even perhaps even 100 miles away, up, up 81. I mean, 81's a big roadway um, that goes far beyond Syracuse. Uh, it's one of the biggest freight corridors in the country. 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big, I mean, even $1.3 billion, I think, was, was the cost for the community grid. That's still a lot of, it's a lot of money. It's less than $4 billion or whatever the, the tunnel option would be, but still a billion dollars is a, it's a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of risk, but there's a lot of reward. Uh, but the sooner, right, I think that there can be action or at least granular metrics, right, behind this, then all the better because, I, I mean, I'm not privy to like, exactly what the state's timeline is here, but I know in like Texas, I mean, Dallas is another market that has been dealing with some similar issues with I-345 and TxDOT was saying, look, if you guys don't get your act together, I mean, we're gonna prepare it. Like, we're not gonna wait for you to sit on your hands. So, you know, it's, it's hard, because it's like you wanna be thorough, you wanna be calculated, but then time is pressing too, so it, it can't wait. So it's, anyway, it, it's not easy, but, but I, you know, I think the more granular and specific you can get um, would help. I don't really have anything to, uh, to decrease your worry, Grant, but I, I but a couple anecdotes that, that have, um, caused me to worry as well. Um, one was uh, that, you know, in my conversations with some of our suburban counterparts, uh, there has been, in some cases, an acknowledgement that the problems that they have can be decoupled from 81 and could be addressed right now. But also, I guess I should give them credit for their candor, uh, uh, an unwillingness to even begin talking uh, about solving those problems or exploring solutions to those problems uh, until a decision is made because they don't want to you know, show their hand uh, or, or impact that decision. So that's frustrating um, and, and again really increases the urgency for me that, that a decision needs to be made. And on a, on a more positive uh, tone, I had a, a small business owner recently talk to me about uh, the opportunities that he saw from the construction and that and was saying that you know there might be some restaurants that uh, that are going to be severely impacted uh, during construction that could change their business model temporarily and you know whether it's through food trucks or other you know could actually cater specifically to those um, to, to to those construction workers or, uh, or related opportunities uh, but again the longer that we're focusing our time and energy and resources on debating what's the right decision uh, the less time we're going to have to be focusing on how we take full advantage of, of the opportunity in front of us the really important thing is to get going. Yeah. Right. You know, things will happen. Uh, uh, absolutely. Right. And, and then to show my additional naivete, <laughs> $1 billion is like less than one hundredth of an aircraft carrier. So a $1 billion is not that much money uh, if you decide of a particular priority. Now, I know I'm being naive, but so you can say it's a lot of money, but you can also say that it's not a lot of money given the capacity of this country if you just rejigger a couple of things. I do. At one point, I saw a statistic that said 12% of our gross national product travels from south to north on Route 81. So if 12% of our GDP is resting on what we do on this highway, then I agree, then coming up with a billion dollars to fix it might not be um, too out, outlandish. I guess when I say a billion, I'm thinking, as, as the current debate is in Washington, which is also another timeline, <laughs> which is moving even probably more glacially uh, than this, uh, for that and, that, and that drop in the bucket, which it is, federally speaking, it, yeah. But, but if there's an expectation, as there seems to be at the moment, that, hey, if you guys wanna do this, you gotta pick yourselves up by your own bootstraps, and you know, already at an operating deficit. I mean, that's the challenge. And a lot of places across the country that aren't the Bostons, the Seattles, that kind of have their revenues, relatively speaking, in order, <laughs> or at least are growing. Uh, you know, it's easier for them to to have the appetite or really the the way, the means to do some of this. But unfortunately, there are a lot of places across the country, and it's just not just transportation infrastructure. It's water infrastructure. We think of Flint, Michigan, other places that are kind of in the middle, declining populations, and they have some significant fiscal challenges that need to be weighed alongside some of these, these investment needs. Uh, Boston was the Detroit of the 1950s and 60s. It lost 250,000 population out of a t population of uh, 600,000. So, you know what? About the time that the decision was made, back in 1982 or something, Actually, Boston was not the Boston that it is today. The big thing may even have had a small role in making Boston the Boston it is today rather than the way it was. So 
Uh, you know, it's not entirely fair to say, oh, it's easy in Boston, but it's hard somewhere else. Actually, get going, <laughs> and, and amazing things will happen. <coughs> Again, said in a kind of naive way. Yeah, well, we've got, uh, we've got a really good chunk of time here for uh, audience to uh, make brief remarks or very brief remarks or pose questions to the group. And it's an over full room, so I know we're going to have tons of questions. So it's, it's, it's good to leave this much time for it. So again, uh, if I could just ask you to raise your hand and do we have one microphone or two microphones going around the room? One. Okay, one. So, so we'll so we'll just we'll just call on folks one at a time, and we'll take this gentleman here, who's near you, Larry, and and then if you could, if you if you do have a specific panelist to direct your question to, um, please do include that. Thank you all for your insight here today and, and your thoughts. I would like to move us right off of whether we like one or the other and go to the process that we're in. We've taken so long, uh, Professor Kruger, because of a process of the state and the DOT and delay tactics, which do nothing but prolong the decision that we need to make quickly. Uh, we have a better situation. We have a, we have a city county with a long history. We actually have a city county planning organization that could work together to take us forward as the voice of what the community needs, the whole CNY community. But we seem to have a lot of delays by having the DOT as the lead agency. Is there anything you can tell us in your other projects about how a community like ours can get its act together, city, county, to define its goals, as the mayor is putting his energies into, and, uh, and get to the right decision with the DOT quickly. We need to support the DOT. They're good folks doing good work, but they're being delayed. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Anybody want to jump in on it? <laughs> I can call on people. <laughs> Bob, do you, have, do you have suggestions? I suspect you have some thoughts. <laughs> well, yeah, we do. It's to get the city county together as you're working towards. Look at the benefit to, I'm sorry, looking to the benefit of a win-win all around, showing that to the public, yeah. and then letting the public lead us to those good visions. The strength is in the good news that this thing can mean to all of us for the next not one generation. I'm at the point now where I have grandchildren. So I'm talking, this is a three generation decision for all of us. It's the greatest opportunity we've had in city planning. It's the greatest economic transition to our past. It's the greatest transition to equity in housing and fair access to, to better businesses on the North Salina, North Salina and South Salina. The community's got a lot of good news here. And I think that we can do this, but the process has been very difficult and the misinformation that's out there has not been able to be confronted by those who have the data, which is the DOT. The DOT has a tremendous amount of information, but it's having a lot of trouble getting it out to the public. So we need to express the win-win across the board and show the public uh, what the real facts are. Thank you. Uh, pressure from the community, of course, would be essential. But I think some... Uh, strong leadership at every scale, city councilor, mayors, co congressmen, <laughs> governors, is also very important. Actually, uh, I get back to Boston for a second, it's actually our political leadership that kind of it took an awful lot of risks uh, and pushed it uh, against, you know, equally difficult odds. There's no way to make this thing easy. There's no, no, no not at all. But I think that uh, sustained and consensus leadership from at every level of government, I think would be very important. In a, and perhaps support obviously by strong community support for that as opposed to opposition from the community or person across the community. I would also add, I mean, as I kind of mentioned my uh, presentation and then also you talked about Alex said and bringing up Boston, I mean, there are other places that are testing out things, right? So yeah. looking beyond Syracuse, right? Maybe going to New Haven and be like, hey, like what's working, what isn't? Uh, go to Boston, right? Like, you know, what did we learn? Uh, there are examples out there. I mean, and so that I think would help at least set a little bit more of a, of a stage um, to getting that better information. Janelle, did you want to add something about the community piece? Well, there's been 
several attempts since 2005 to bring together members of the community and locally elected uh, officials to talk about these issues, um, but they're, they're done often you know, in isolation. There's not coherence among them. They're either neighborhood-based or at a regional level, and attendance varies, and some of our most outspoken community members tend to uh, go to those. So I, I think, for one, it, it is on us as a community to get out into the actual neighborhoods and help people understand what's at stake and get their opinions. I've often wondered if this is something that would be useful in a referendum. I heard you folks mention that in other s communities there had been a referendum vote on what to do. Uh, but I agree with Bob that we do need to have some kind of a regional vision. And we've been lacking a regional uh, economic development strategy and vision for a very long time. And so if we were to just take 81 off the table, for example, and, and think about where do we want to be as um, a community, or a city, and a, as a region in 20 to 50 years, it might then make more sense for us. A, a, an, an option might emerge from those conversations that feeds into our goals to be uh, a city that's equitable and that has um, equality and growth and that we're trying to raise the tide for all ships at one time is, and we're interested in thinking about how we continue to make s the city strong in order to feed strong suburbs. I saw a hand shoot up right away over here. Oh, you've got the microphone. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, my question uh, actually really comes off of the uh, previous comments uh, just now, um, specifically about the need to reframe and uh, re-engage, the, the, reframe the discussion and re-engage the community on this because um, fatigue has been used as a pretty good tactic and I think that's all the tunnel really um, has amounted to. Uh, but specifically, Janelle, on, on, you had a slide that indicated uh, five, an estimate of about five million in revenue, um, which I'm guessing is annually, but might be low, I think. Um, could that be part of the reframing that the city, of course, has financial needs that are um, pretty immediate and that, um, you know, this is more than just uh, an infrastructure or traffic problem, but it's a matter of what do you do with uh, prime economic development real estate? Do you, you know, pave over it <laughs> or um, dig it up for 10 years? So I guess the question is um, what, what needs to happen to reframe and re-engage the community on this right now? That's a really good question. I think we have an opportunity to do that because we have a new locally elected mayor and a mayor that I, I have to say, that's right. That's right. Um, but you know, if I can just reflect on what I witnessed during the campaign in these first few months in office, um, I think our mayor has done a phenomenal job of engaging stakeholders and residents and constituents that have long been left out of many dialogues in our city, especially as they relate to economic opportunity. So I think it, now, at least with that new change in leadership, we, and now that we see the new uh, independent study that's come out on the tunnel, this might reinvigorate our conversations, but it is difficult to get around that fatigue. When I talk to Southside residents that I work with, they're just like, just make the damn decision already and so we can get on with our lives. But when I ask, well, do you know what that means by making the decision? Do you know what's at stake? Do you know what the costs are? Do you know what we might add or detract from our local communities? There's not really that awareness. So somehow the myriad public conversations that we've had around this issue over the last 12 years have still not really permeated uh, with, within our local communities. And that's not just in the city, it's in our suburbs as well. Um, and, and as far reaching as up to Watertown, when the mayor of Watertown wrote an op-ed suggesting that he didn't support the community grid because he wouldn't have an easy commute to the airport. That's just completely <laughs> infactual. <laughs> so we have to get out into our suburban and rural communities as well to make sure that we're all working with the same set of facts before we can try to come to consensus. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, so this might turn out to be more of a comment than a question. Um, and it, it really, uh, Janelle, touched on this about a referendum before and just thinking about all the different voices 
that have been excluded from this conversation and the presumption that we live in a democratic society, um, even though democracy is dangerous sometimes, um, sh should we not be having a, a referendum on this? Uh, even a non-binding referendum would, would send a very clear message. Um, in, in the three or four years that I've been um, asking people about this, um, I have asked two questions, who decides and when? And these are questions that you know, keep getting shoved off and moved off. And I think because it has such a large impact on the city of Syracuse, um, we should be deciding. And when we decide that, I don't know, but as, as soon as possible. And I don't know, maybe this is a question for the mayor, ha has the, the, the question of a referendum come up or is that something that we can actually enact? Are there um, legal, political mechanisms that we can use to even create a non-binding uh, non-binding referendum on this. It has not come up uh, in in the conversations that I've had. I'm, I'm frankly really intrigued by that idea. Um, Maurice, it looked, did you have a specific thought on referendum or or just in general? Yeah. Okay, uh, but uh, I, I'm very much open to that idea. I'd add, I'd add just from kind of monitoring different referenda that have passed or not passed. I mean, 75% of transportation ballot referenda have passed. So the case is made to voters. Often voters do voice their support for infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure is not just, again, an engineering project, right, and preferred alternatives and environmental impact statements, but this is something that we deal with every day. And this is a very visible form of infrastructure, unlike a lot of our water infrastructure, which is buried and just out of mind. Uh, but also referenda have failed to pass before. Uh, in Atlanta, you know, they tried to pass a referendum and it failed. But then they came back a year later and it passed. So it, you know, it's kind of this winding process, right? It, it's not just an absolute, you know, drop dead decision on one date, but, but it kind of goes onward. Could I make a frivolous suggestion? Next July 4th, shut down 81 and ha allow people to walk all over it. Um, maybe have the fireworks there. Uh, and um, see what happens to traffic. That, that happens to be my, my birthday, and I couldn't think of a better birthday. <laughs> now, where it's not entirely frivolous is, if there's actually some resistance to, oh my God, how, could it how can we possibly survive, prove that the world does not end? Yeah. A couple of years ago, speaking of auto Margeden, whatever that was called, uh, Los Angeles had to reconstruct 405. That was really gonna be yeah. the end of the world. Guess what, it wasn't. Uh, a couple of cities actually have tried, perhaps not, not at the scale of, of an interstate highway. You'd have to have the support of, uh, not TechStot, <laughs> which I'm involved with, but whatever it's called, New York Dot, right? <laughs> uh, uh, have actually done something like this. That is, you know, shut down uh, a piece of a road, uh, make it a kind of a celebratory event, and see what happens. It, it may actually prove Referendums can be, you know, can have the opposite effect. If there really, I don't know, but if there really is strong resistance to this, prove that the end of the world will not come. All those trucks will still get through and, you know, you're just gonna be two minutes late. So there's other ways to kind of uh, find a way to kind of overcome what is a sort of ingrained and now old idea that the car and our ability to get anywhere as fast as possible depends upon use of the car on highways. One of the points that she made about uh, how it doesn't take you any longer, Dallas is a perfect example of that, right? Everyone's on the highway. Everyone is on the highway, and they're building highways, I'm sorry to report. No one is on the streets. And people are starting to realize, there's a movement like this actually in Dallas too. <laughs> If you drive on the streets, you can get the places faster. <laughs> you actually can get things faster, especially during rush hour, right? Yeah. So try shutting it down for a day. You'd have to get some, uh, you know, obviously support from officials. I'm gonna mark, I'm gonna mark that on my calendar twice now. <laughs> Three times, it's the mayor's birthday and 4th of July. And, uh, I wanna jump in on that if I could Harvard just quickly. Day, that would be a good one too. Oh, yeah. Just, just I, I wanna throw a, a one, one note of caution, though, to, to the idea that it's, it's not a reason not to do it, but a note of caution about the referendum, and that's, and more generally, which is that my sense is that there is not universal, but a, a consensus that, that has emerged and is continuing to emerge on this issue in favor of the community grid. 
if you if you reinforce that and you and you put it in a sense in writing through a referendum and then the unthinkable happens my concern would be is what does that do for political legitimacy and um, community engagement in the city and thinking about the city and the state which has already had a history there so I, that's not a reason not to do it, but I think it would be something just to bear in mind if, as we think about that. There's a hand that shot up there. And you've yeah, so uh, this actually follows up with what Grant just said. So, so the whole question about framing, we heard that the facts are kind of on the side of the community grid, but we also know that facts are not what, what decides things in our political or social life anymore. And so what we need are sound bites and good stories and we need advertising, you know, lobbying and money behind it. And I worry the same way about a referendum because I think the money is on the side, the lobbying money is on the side of defeating that kind of a referendum. So figuring out how to tell those stories and I like the idea of looking at places that are more like Syracuse than Boston or Seattle that have done this successfully. I think um, Milwaukee's another one we could look at. But really thinking in terms of the stories and also something that didn't really get said. I mean, the, the, the city-suburban divide in this is a, a set of narratives that go way, way back in American history and, and are probably more potent now, the kind of hatred of the city by the people who don't live in cities is pretty intense. And so figuring out stories that really transcend that, I think the way Ben's been trying to work with people outside the city to really tell a joint story and how we are one community is incredibly important, but it's also really hard. So getting our creative people involved in coming up with these kinds of stories and storylines that can unite us is really important. Thanks. Hi, it's up here. So um, infrastructure can often be used almost like chess pieces as bargaining chips. And I was really taken, Grant, by your question to the panel about the probability of which outcome would be chosen. And so I want to turn that question back around on you as a political scientist, if, if you don't mind. So we all know that John DeFrancisco is running for governor. We also all know who he's running against. That's supposed to get a laugh, okay? <laughs> um, so does this decision I think it's a county executive first, but go ahead. Okay. Is he not running for governor? But he's He's got to get past a county executive, oh, right. but go ahead. Okay, so does this become part of a voter enticement or a voter, yeah, I guess an, a voter enticement device? So who does Cuomo need more? Does he need CNY at all, or does he need the city of Syracuse, or does he need to somehow sway voters in the suburbs in order to get re-election, or does this not figure into this at all? So I'm just wondering if these um, kind of state-level politics, since state DOT is making this decision, might not play into this, and do we see the election become another excuse for kicking the can down the road yet again? Wow. <laughs> it's a complex problem, and it was a complex question, right. so I apologize. No, that's okay. I'm, I, you're putting me on the spot, and I'm going to ask for help from my panelists on this. Let me just try to say a couple quick things. First, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to try to get inside of a uh, politician's head, and, and certainly wouldn't presume to get in, try to get inside Senator DeFrancisco's head. However, um, my experience of him over the years is my sense that, that, that he's kind of telling things like it is, for how he sees things, and my sense of the timing of this is that the, the I-81 stuff may predate the more serious run for a governor, but I, you know, I, again, I, I can't get inside of that. Um, what I would say, though, I think, in thinking about the politics of this, in terms of the governor's race, and there's someone sitting behind you who probably has a better read on this than I do, but, but that is that I think the incentive of the governor probably is just to delay the decision. 
because you're, you're going to make some people angry. And, and the, the concern would be to make the fewest people angry rather than try to count up how many people am I making happy that are going to vote for me because of this versus being angry. So if I had to put my money on some idea of what would be sort of the politically most desirable thing, it would be to delay, to have that decision come after an election. Having said that, though, the landscape of New York and the politics of New York and where the voters are and who's going to vote for whom because of party identification and all that kind of makes this, in some ways, rounding error for the people that are here. But in terms of the impression that it makes across the state and having the controversy and having the blowback from that, that is something that could you know, have an impact beyond Syracuse. So that's probably the way I would think a, a politician is thinking of it. I don't know if any of you want to jump in on that one. <laughs> you want to talk about this, don't you, Mayor? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Brown, Hi, thank you for uh, speaking. So my concern is something um, that hasn't been addressed yet, but it's something that maybe Mr. Prager's um, Fourth of July plan might allude to. Um, so uh, there seems to be a general inclination towards the city um, grid plan, um, but no one talked about the pedestrian safety or pedestrian um, connectivity that would um, happen if there was an increase in traffic. So like there's a you know there's a worldwide trend of everyone moving to the city, and I guess we'd want to densify Syracuse in terms of population. But what would that mean for um, pedestrian? Um, connectivity and safety and the projects that Mr. Krager showed earlier, the Korea project and the one in China, they all, they all, the, uh, they all turned highways into pedestrian projects, the waterfront <coughs> or the river. So what kind of ideas or research has been done in terms of pedestrian connectivity? You know, the, the streets today may not be so safe. <laughs> so this is why I'm saying that one of the advantages of undertaking the, the, the community grid project is you would first start with improving the streets that are there. You would invest in them. Uh, you could even start doing so tomorrow if there's a little modicum of money. You'd start, and, and this is happening also, apart from highway demolishing or not, there's a tremendous, I, I appreciate the comment about cities versus suburbs. There's actually a bit of a revolution going on around the country right now, where the kind of the suburban century is waning a little bit, uh, just a little bit. Uh, and there's a lot of investment at a very simple level on on streets and lands. And when I mentioned Arbor Day, I wasn't I wasn't kidding. On, on improving the normal streets in a city by widening sidewalks, by planting trees, by improving stormwater management, and so forth. One of, the things that, one of the things that could start with the community grid is by improving the streets that you have uh, to the point where people will start to appreciate that as opposed to worry about more trucks killing pedestrians when the highway comes down. So I don't have a, I don't have a panacea here. There, aren't, there are not panaceas for any of these issues that we're discovering. But, but I think to being a little bit more adventuresome as opposed to being very cautious is probably not the way to succeed ultimately. I'd also add just, you know, in sort of juxtaposition to the mid 20th century model, right, of just congestion reduction and maximizing speed. You know, I'd say a lot of planners now have discredited that, right? They know that it's, that it's not right. Engineers, I don't know. <laughs> at least at a state level, I, I mean, there's a lot of vested, you know, interests and, and just the training even of, I mean, that is the way in which we still very much design and plan our big infrastructure projects. But, but even there, things yeah. are changing a little That's bit, right. even amongst the engineering uh, profession. That's right. So point is, I think you're right. I, I think there, there needs to be kind of this bottom up, you know, full look at the built environment, not just sort of where it ends at the curb, uh, but how it all works together. I agree that we do need to pay attention to alternative modes of transportation, like walking and biking and our historic emphasis on putting cars on highways and traveling at very high speeds doesn't do that. Um, with, the mo with the different alternatives that are proposed for Syracuse, clearly I think the viaduct, raising the viaduct has the least opportunity to improve pedestrian and bicycle modes of transportation in the city. The tunnel does allow for improvements for pedestrians and bicycles, as does the community grid. 
What I think is interesting about the community grid and this thought about thinking about this, how we move around the city more holistically um, is that we do, we will see improved pedestrian traffic um, going under the highway or near the highway. So uh, if any of you get off at the Harrison Street exit, uh, there's often pedestrians that are coming from some of the medical facilities on the western side of the highway to the hospitals on the eastern side. And that's an incredibly dangerous and scary area to navigate. And the community grid and tunnel obviously would help to reduce those, those problems. With the community grid, I think it would force us as a community to think about other intersections and other passageways for pedestrians because just like our cars, our people are going to be redistributed differently. And that says a lot for um, environmental sustainability for our, our entire city that if we have to ripple, ripple out our thinking to think about how we improve bicycle and pedestrian passageways throughout the rest of the city, um, that we're having a, a positive impact on um, environmental d degradation that's caused by using vehicles all the time. So let's try to squeeze in two last questions and uh, quick, quick questions, quick answers. You've got one over here, Larry. I'll try to be quick. I'll try to be quick. Uh, good luck. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, to uh, Mr. Krieger. Um, Krieger, sorry. Um, you had given examples about like other cities and how they had went through it. My question involves uh, the nature of those cities. Uh, at Syracuse, we're a very diverse city, both racially and uh, economically, with like, uh, um, like some wealthier like surrounding towns. But one thing that I find is people don't want to drive through the city. Like when the traffic gets dispersed through the city, they don't want to drive through the city because that's where like the black and brown people are. So um, in any of those other cities, uh, have they encountered problems like that? And I guess it could be to anyone if anyone's done research, I haven't. But have they encountered that problem, and how did they handle it? You're asking, of course, an almost impossible question to answer because it, it, you know it's it's uh, it's an abstract issue. Again, Boston is not undiverse. Boston has also been called very racist and has a very racist history. I'm not trying to project some kind of. Uh, you know, heaven there, right? Uh, there are far fewer streets today in Boston that people, white or otherwise, fear the drive-through than there was 25 years ago. That's all I can say, right? So things change, right? Uh, Boston, again, has incorporated about several hundred miles now, uh, linear miles of bicycle lanes. That's crazy in a way, because we have no straight streets, and they're pretty narrow. And at first, people thought this was just, insa just as insane as the guy in Korea saying, we'll just stop the highway. Guess what? The number of people who are now using bicycles is enormous. So what has to change, and what is changing, too slowly, but what is changing is uh, the uh, hierarchy that says the car is the most important thing. Right? And at some point, you start hitting a little bit of a cal calibration where the bicycle is just as important, or the pedestrian is just as important. And you can see this happening on certain streets, right? Where the pedestrian gets to be arrogant. How do you get there, right? The first pedestrian acting arrogantly will get killed. <laughs> but at some point, right, the, the arrogance of the pedestrian or the cyclist will start to affect others. And that is happening, not just in big cities, it is happening in cities. Uh, the question is, how do you get it going? How do you get it going? Syracuse may not be ready yet. At some point, it will be. Uh, I can give you many examples around the country where all of a sudden, there's a bit of an equilibrium between I and the car being most important versus I as a cyclist uh, is just as important. Uh, that's a slight roundabout way of getting to your answer, but uh, I, I, I don't know how fearful people are in Syracuse. I can tell you that over 25 years, a tremendous difference has happened in Boston where fewer such people feel somehow that uh, they do not want to drive through a certain kind of street. I'm sure there's still some who, who do feel that way. So I, I'd just like to add to that briefly. Uh, I, I look up here. 
that looks like a pretty scary place to walk around. And so I think we need to think about how our infrastructure and how our past bad, poor planning decisions have uh, perpetuated and uh, created that sense of, uh, of insecurity. Uh, when you don't have density and development, it's not just the, the, the viaduct, it's the in one to two block radius in every direction where you have surface parking and no man's land where we know that uh, people feel safe when they're surrounded by, um, by activity. And so I think that we can, uh, that if, if we do this the right way, we can increase that sense of safety, both real and perceived. And one last super quick one, yes. So I will, uh, I'll preface my question with a statement. The city of San Diego already did at least some version of this. And I would ask you to consider electronic traffic management, enhanced traffic management system in the entire corridor especially if you have the community grid. For example, in, in, in this room, almost everybody probably has a smartphone. So if I had an app on my smartphone that said, oh, well, you should be turning left here now because there is an analysis by a major overarching system that's looking at the en entire corridor, directing traffic and optimizing it, you know, even even factors of air pollution, that kind of stuff, to really optimize it. I think Syracuse has the opportunity to create a showcase here out of this really difficult uh, challenge. Thank you. Please consider it. Put it on a Garmin, maybe, not a smartphone. I've almost been hit too many times by distracted drivers, but <laughs> I get the point. Uh, that's all we have time for. I'm sure we had tons more questions, but let me just thank the panelists again. Thank you.